I say many times, before we say the Amida in the morning, we say Ezra's, and we recount all the things God has done for us. And if you stop and think, when you delineate every one of them, and you focus on one, for one of them alone is enough to be thankful and sing God's praises forever. And we say multiple things that God did for us in the past. If not for that, we wouldn't exist today. We were deemed from Egypt, we deemed from the house of bondage. We left Egypt, he destroyed our enemies, one after another. And yet we just keep, there's no molding there. We just, as I was saying, it was God's assistance to our forefathers, what he did. But over here, what modem is, we give thanks. And the thanks over here, we don't delineate anything we said in Ezra. Over there, we're delineating many things. What we mentioned in the Ezra, it's something which has no relevance to us in our lifetimes. <coughs> it's something happened in the past. Ezra of Hussein, they were taken out of Egypt. He drowned our enemies in the Red Sea. All these things, that's in the past. What's modem? Modem is in the present. I'm giving thanks to you. Acknowledgement, you're our God. The relationship is what is cannot be aggregated. It's forever. The mir miracles, the wonders, the ongoing kindness, the inexhaustible level of mercy, the unending level of chesed. We're talking about we are now, presently, we're the beneficiaries of all this. So let's talk about something of the past. We're talking about the present. If you acknowledge and you relate and you recognize the reality of every moment of our life, you no question, you will acknowledge it and you'll be thankful and beholden to Hashem because of that. That's the modem. Therefore, the past has no relevance. We're giving thanks for the present. Although we have to be thankful for the past, but that's not our obligation today. The obligation this moment is, let's first talk about the present. After we talk about the present, then we can talk about the past. On Shabbos, before the Shochenad, we say Nishmas, very lengthy paragraph. And then we say, after delineating all that God did for us, protects us from illness, providing us with life, we said, If our mouths would be filled with praise, with song, it would be the equivalent of the waves of the ocean. We wouldn't have sufficient capacity to thank you, to praise you all that you've done for us. And over there, we do mention many things of the past. But over there, it's cumulative to come to the present. Right now, we're speaking about the present. What, what are you doing from us? You know, we spoke about entitlement. Could you imagine a person wage-wise is not worth more than $20,000 a year? And the employer says, you know something? Of course, I know you, you, you're you overrated in your own eyes. I'm going to pay you a half a million dollars a year. Because you're overrated, okay? And after receiving the half a million dollars, the person says, I think I deserve more. I think I'm entitled to more. I said, why? If you're only worth 20000 I'm giving you half a million. How can you be entitled to more? Yeah, there must be something wrong with you. I mean, your evaluation is so off, it's clear you don't even deserve the 20,000. Now, how is it possible? No, I didn't say for you to. So, how could you consider being entitled for, for, for more than half a million if you're not, if clear you don't even deserve 20,000? If you go through the modem and we acknowledge and give thanks for what God did for us. You're our God. 
The creator is his people forever. You're the caretaker of our souls. You give us life. You bring miracles. You bring wonders. Everything's unceasing. Your mercy is unlimited, inexhaustible. After articulating all that, how could we feel for a moment that God, after everything said, that owes us anything? He's already paid us mega, mega dollars. After having mega dollars, how could you feel entitled? So if a person truly internalizes the modem correctly, it's impossible to have a sense of what of entitlement. How could you feel entitled? God just fleshed out all that he gave you. Or the Achikinesa Agdola, the Men of High Assembly authored this. They're telling us reality. This is what you've received to date. So if that's the case, how could you feel you worthy, your worthiness should require more, more hand-holding, more stroking. So the, the motive is so crucial. That that we go through the Amida, we ask for all the verse during the supplications. We ask for A through, through Z, for many things we want. But what's the value of the motive? After quantifying and understanding what we are the recipients of, after that, there's nothing more to say. We're finished. There's no longer a claim. We find before Moshe passes away, he last 36 days of his life, he gathers the whole Jewish people together and he speaks to them and gives them Musr. Admonishes them for the past, encourages them for the future. And why does he speak to all of them? Because Moshe says to them, and this is the Midrash, if anybody has anything to say, let them speak that piece now. Because if not everybody's presence, you know what's going to happen? Somebody in the street will say, but what did Moshe say? He said such and such. He says, you know, if I would have been there, I would have said something. I would have spoken up. So Moshe says, right now, you're all here. And if anything I'm saying is not clear or justified or cogent and applicable to every one of you, speak your piece at this moment. If not, Remain silent forever. If each one of us says the modem, and we don't leave a detail out in the modem, what God provides, and if we're saying it means we don't deny it. So if we don't deny it, and we're acknowledging it by saying thank you, this our thankfulness, expressing it, I think I have a right. You have no right. You exhausted your rights. First out of balance in the bank, $100,000. And then he withdraws more than that. He's overdrawing the account. And the bank calls him, saying you're overdrawing. And you know, you're going to have a penalty. You have to pay interest. And we're going to put a lien on your property. He says, why? He says, I have 100000 But you overdrew the account. You can't take out of the account more than it's in the account. You've taken that, not only that, because you were such a good client all the years, we added another 100000 that you were able to take out. You took out even more than you deserved. And you claim that the bank owes you. You could send in your accountant there. And they could do our books. And you'll see, we owe you nothing. And we even given you more than you deserved. We gave the interest payments that you didn't deserve. So I see the modem as being so crucial in a person's perception of himself and God, that you really have to stop and focus on the modem and take it slow. Firstly, modem, we measly nobodies, pygmies, amoebas. We give thanks to you, you, the Almighty, the creative world took us to be your people. So you can say, take it or leave it. You're the rock of our existence forever that we speak about. And we give thanks to you and praise to you for taking care of our soul, restoring our soul, the miracles, the wonders. That's reality. You're all beneficiaries continuously. You're so weighted down with goods, with gifts, 
with payments, you have nowhere to store the documents for all you received. You know, a person is a real estate mogul. He owns in the business district, he owns many of the office buildings. 80% and he has the deeds and the mortgages are paid off. And all of a sudden, another building comes up for sale and he bids on it and somebody beats him out on the bid. He's upset, God. All the charity I give, don't you think I should have gotten that bid? Why did they reject my bid? Firstly, the 80% of the real estate that you own, how do you think you, 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 you won the bid to have the, that real estate? Who gave you the funds? And who gave you the credibility? And who gave people the confidence that you'd be able to pay those mortgages all these years? You got it backwards. It's like the employee believes that the employer is working for him. We think God is beholden to us and we have to be beholden to him. So if you really say the modem and focus as you say it, the way you should say it, after everything's said and done, God owes you nothing and you have a balance yet for what he gave you that you don't deserve. And that's, that's being mature. An immature person, as much as he say what you've given him, he doesn't even say what you're talking about. Because as he says, I've given you, he thinks in his mind, that's what he thinks. But the truth is, I did him a favor by taking it. He gave me the gift to, to relieve his own conscience. Because he knew he couldn't live with the guilt, not giving me a pittance what he really owed me. You ever hear such a perverted mind? You have to have a really warped mind to process in that context. But factually, unless your emotion and mind is geared through Torah, you could think off the rails. Your perspective is off and you can justify it, although it's not justifiable. I'm just pointing out, this is the value and importance of saying modim with a proper focus and do it deliberately slowly. And as I said, to savor it, to take it all in and be touched by it. And when, once you do that, there's nothing more to talk about. I'm thankful for the rest of the day, for the rest of your life, for whatever God does. Then you become a person of the Yeshli Kol. I have it all. Because God has given you it all. Yes, any law-abiding citizen, told me a Jew, he said, what is life all about? To responsibly, to raise a family, and to raise them appropriately, is to educate them, to clothe them, to feed them, give them security, and they should become productive people. And you have all that, they're healthy, they're, they have presence, and they have all this great potential. And initially said, that's your purpose in existence, and to have a roof over my head and succeed. And you have succeeded. So if you initially, the way you, you, you wrote the model, the perspectives, perspectives of your life, what's missing? But yet, God provides everything, uh, including more, and yet you're still not satisfied. That's the reality of most people. There's always the but. Yeah, I'd like something else. And we're not even ashamed to ask for it. Could you imagine you want to get a, an appointment with the king, which is nearly impossible, and finally you get the appointment. And you're going to have an audience. And the king is happy to respond to your request. And you say to the king, you know, since I'm a kid, I haven't had eaten Howard Johnson ice cream because they've been out of business. 
that there's nothing you can't do. You could recreate Howard Johnson and I could eat that pistachio green ice cream again and I could be literally like that little child again. The king looks at this kid, at this grown adult says, is that what you're wasting my time with? That's, that's what you wanted this audience. And you went through endless people to convince me to give you my time. You know how valuable my time is and you're wasting time with this minutia, this nonsense, this foolishness. God says, you're my children. You have a right to request anything you want. The door is always up. You have an audience. But you understand, it's, it's, an, it's an abusal of a relationship. Something which is important, integral, has values, one thing. But something which is not sensical. You know, my wife, the old mean coat, it, it has the, the level of, of calligraphy. Her name is in the coat, the lining. It's, there's a new style today. And I want to make her happy. I want to buy her a new mink coat. Is that what you're asking God? Maybe if your life is making your, your wife's making your life miserable and you can't survive, say, God, help, help me survive. So whatever you need, you need that bribe to bribe her with the mink coat. Okay, it's one thing. But people don't ask for that reason. Because you want your wife to have that sable coat. Till now it's mink, now it's sable. You know, maybe you have to go to Putin and get his wife's sable coat. I'm sure she has a full full closet of them. And you can pull that out of the Tsar's museum, the coat she wore, the Tsar's, the Tsarina. Because I appreciate all that you've given me. And I feel that I'm a debtor after acknowledging all that I said. And yet God doesn't hold us to be debtors. Despite overwhelmingly, he attends to all our needs. Therefore, for all this that you've done for us, is borach. You, are, you will be blessed, meaning you, your essence, which is un, unceasingly giving, all will be exalted. Your name, our king, continues to forever. Meaning we can't stop being appreciative for all that you've done because we truly internalize the reality of that. It's like person says, I will never forget. Never. I'll be beholding you forever, forever, forever. You know, my father, Allah Shalom, maybe I mentioned in the past, he was orphaned when he was six years old, 1926. And in those years, nobody looked after you. If your parents didn't take care of you, you were a ward of, the, of nobody. And you had to fend for yourself. And... When he was a young man, he went through plenty till he became an adult and he was just starting out and he had a friend and his friend had money, was successful. And he really helped him, lent him some money to be able to get on his feet and do things. There's an expression, a friend in need is a friend indeed. That's what he used to say. He used to, and my father always could never forget what this man did for him, ever. We're talking about 50, 60 years later. Didn't forget. Because that kindness that he did made a difference in his life forever. Other people have short memories. We've already stated in the modem multiple, multiple things God did for us. Miracles, wonders. Our life, he's the caretaker of our soul. His mercy is unceasing. We wouldn't survive for a moment. For all that... Your name should be blessed, exalted. Our king, we recognize. Usually a king is stern, harsh. He's interested in himself. No, our king is the most benevolent, giving, unceasing kindness forever. Your name shall be exalted and blessed forever. But that is a quantification of the reality to what degree you internalize it. And if you stop there and factually 
you mean what you said. You will never complain ever again, in the, not, not, not for a moment in your life. What do you have to complain about? And we say it every day. So, and yet people still, they feel God has given the short end of the stick. But you just said, modim. We say every day a, a psalm three times a day, ashrei. Ashrei yoshrei sech od yadmuchasela. Fortune of those who dwell in your house. Ashrei yoshrei sech. The dwellers of your house, they're the most fortunate. Od yadmuchasela. In addition, we'll praise you. Persons in synagogue, in the study hall. And the, the shir was supposed to be 23 minutes. And the rabbi went over 24 minutes. They said, your rabbi, you're infringing on my time. I thought it was 23, not 24. So the rabbi says to the constituent, you just said, Asher Yeshu Vesecho. Fortune to those who dwell in your house. This is God's house. It's a, it's, it's a study hall. We're teaching Torah here. Here you say, Asher Yeshu Vesecho, and then you're running. Where are you running to? Evidently, clearly, what you say, you don't mean. Because if you, if you mean what you said, you'd want to stay there as long as you could stay there. David Amel says, What does David want? I want to see the, the pleasance of God and to visit his sanctuary. That was David's request. As much as I have, I never have enough of it. person goes to Canyon Ranch, you know, one of these spas, they even give him a t-shirt and that's his pride and joy that he takes back with it. And they say, you know something, normally for this fee, we, we, we give you a week, but we're going to give you two weeks for one week. The person is so thankful he could stay another week in Canyon Ranch and eat grass for breakfast, lunch, and supper three times a day for another week. And he's ecstatic because he's staying another week in Kenya Ranch. And if he could stay another five minutes in the base Medrash, Lazarus no Mashem, and you say, you say, Rabbi, you're holding me up here. I have to get back to the office. So it's it's literally being two-faced. Here we say, Modim, we can't be thankful enough. And there's no level of what, of entitlement after all God did for us. And we say, therefore, you should be praised and exalted forever. And yet you feel somehow God gave you the short end of the stick. So how, how does it jive? You know what the answer is? It doesn't. And, and because it doesn't jive, there's a little bit of a claim that you weren't really truthful when you said those words. And therefore, I always say, hey, when we begin the Amidah, we say, Hashem Open our lips and let me speak your praises. Not to speak in a, as a two-faced person. I say one thing, I need something else. It should truly be a praises that I mean it, that I'm able to internalize the reality of what I'm saying. Because if I'm touched by what I'm saying, I don't feel shortchanged. I have no sense of beholdenness of entitlement any longer. I'm beholding forever because I can't stop singing your praises because I recognize that you've given me beyond the pale of what I deserve. And without you, I wouldn't exist. That's the value of the modem. And, and that's what we conclude. And if you can't conclude that, it's a problem. And if you do conclude it and you behave differently, it means you, don't, you didn't mean it. If you pray with a tzibur, we have modem drabonon, that when we review the Shemon Esri, the Amido, the congregation, when the shlich tzibur says his modem, we say another modem. 
It's called Modim Drabonon. It was also legislated by the rabbis. And we say, say something similar, but we say other things there, which is not the same modem as we say when we say the Amido. And what do we say? And in this modem, there's a request. There's a supplication. The modem we just said before, there's no supplication. This modem, we respond, there's a supplication. Let's see what it says. Modim anachdullah. Again, we give thanks to you. Shatohu Hashem Elokeinu Elkeinu Elkeinu Same thing. You're our God, Almighty, and the Almighty of our forefathers. And here we're mentioning something else. Elokeinu Kolbasar. You're the God of all flesh, all humanity, not only us. Yotzreinu. You've developed us. You've created Yotzeb Rashis. And you've created creation initially. You developed creation. Brochos for those, we give blessing and thanks. L'shimcha Godova Kodosh to your great and holy name. It's interesting. We're giving thanks to his holy name. We give thanks to God. Brochos for those, L'shimcha Godova Kodosh. We give blessings and thanks to your great and holy name. Now, what is the name of God? As we said, all the appellations of God are not his essence. But yet he revealed to us that he relates to this existence in certain contexts. So the name of God is the way he's relating within the context of mercy, within the context of power, within the context of indiscriminate kindness. So we're giving blessing. We're saying, we're recognizing that all that emanates from him and we give thanks to the name because the name is through the attribute through which he's relating to this existence and providing whatever he provides to your great and holy name. And what did it provide? All those attributes, all those characteristics. Al Sheikhi Sanu, you gave us life. The Kiyam Tanu. And you gave us permanence. Now a person is given life, he lives for a day. So what's the value of a day? What could you accomplish in a day? Camp Tunnel, no, you maintain us. I bring you into existence, God, he, ca- he carries us throughout our life. He gives us existence. You maintain us. Kent Chaimus Kaimenu. So when we say this, we say, as you've done it until now, you should continue giving us life and giving us that level of permanence, maintaining us. So this is already, this is, this is the supplication in the modem. The modem we say in the Amido, ourselves the silent, there's no, there's no supplication. Here we're saying, as until now, You've given us life and you sustained us and maintained us. You should continue giving us life, maintaining us. And gather in our exiles to to your holy courtyards. Meaning bring us back to the holy sanctuary. For what purpose? to observe your statutes, and to do your will. So what is the supplication we're asking now? What's the value of continually giving us life and giving us permanence and maintaining us? To bring us back, to bring back the exiles to your holy courtyards. This is, we're talking about the rebuilding of the Beis HaMikdosh. To observe your statutes, in exile, there's endless distraction. We don't have clarity. Ultimately, when we're brought back, and there'll be a removal of all evil, we'll have clarity. We will observe your statutes. And to do your will, then we'll do your will. Until now, 
we don't have that sense of clarity and understanding why doing your will is first and foremost. Not only do your will, but it's going to be coupled with self-interest to serve you with a whole full heart. But Levav Shalem, our heart is all the complete heart. It's all yours. Our emotion, our feelings are fully dedicated to you. Let me ask you a question. A person who does not live his life within the Torah perspective, he says this, does he even relate to what he's talking about? An observant Jew. Is that really his yearning? Bringing in gathering exiles, maybe yes, because he sees that's anti-Semitism, whatever else it is. Things are not out, are not easy out there. Discrimination. But is, is the objective Lishmo Chukecho? I want you to gather us in to be able to observe your statutes, to do your will. That's why. Is that is that what's lacking in your life? Because I don't do your will sufficiently. And to serve you with a full heart. That's the objective. And who are we talking to? You know, he told her of Moshe Feinstein, to Rav Steinman, to these holy sages, okay. Their whole lives, that's what it represented. But the average citizen, is that what it's all about? You know, they think about the deal that they're going to close and other things, the trips they're going to plan. But of course, kosher, no question, kosher. Travelers will get in Thursday night, that God forbid we should not violate the Shabbat. Right? And the hotel's five-star glot kosher. Joel Katz caterers, nothing less than that. Because he has the best certification. And we give thanks to you, blessed is the God who has all the praise. How many people could say this sincerely? You have to be attuned in a certain way. You have to think about this. And it doesn't, it doesn't come out of a vacuum. Unless you think about things, you can't be touched by things. And even if you touched, it's for a moment and it's gone. So how does one go through certain mind exercises to create a focus, which only that focus will touch you in a certain way. So we discussed in the past, a Jew has to have a mezuzah on his doorpost. What's contained within that mezuzah? A parchment. On that parchment, it is written the first two paragraphs of the Shema. And it's rolled into that parchment. And on the back of the parchment, it says Shakai, it says God's name. And very often on a mezuzah case, there's a shin. Represent, representing that appellation of God. And there's a custom, it's not a law, one, what touches the, minimally one touches the mezuzah. In the morning, very often you kiss the mezuzah. Meaning to indicate it's something special to you. You value it, you acknowledge it. Otherwise, why are you touching it? Why are you kissing it? So that's the expression of your, of endearment. But what are you supposed to say? When you kiss that mezuzah, so I had mentioned in the past in, in the name of a certain work based on the Zohar, when you kiss that mezuzah in the morning or any time, you're supposed to say and verbalize, I believe with absolute faith, you're the only exclusive one in this existence. Nothing exists outside of you. That's what you're supposed to verbalize. And when you say it, it's just not words. You say it, you feel it. Nobody exists outside of God. Meaning everything in your life is dependent on what he wants. And that's, that's Shema Yisrael. Echod. Everything is him. And if you go and you go through these small exercises of creating 
awareness ultimately accumulated, it'll start somehow touching you. Chaim Velozhino explains that if the Jew believes in ain't old milavado, it's an expression in the Talmud, nothing exists outside of God. Ain't old, ain't old milavado. There's nothing but him. And you say those words. And every once in a while you say those words to remind yourself. But if you say it enough times throughout your day or throughout your lifetime, you can be touched. You will be touched by it. Ain't old milavado. All that makes all that exists is you. You're the determine, determining factor in everything. So that means you're already acknowledging that your spirituality of your life is dependent on God, and your life is dependent on God. And gradually, you get drawn closer. You start warming up, as they say. Before you go into heavy exercise, you have to warm up. Because otherwise, you could actually you could, you could actually become you could get injured. You have to create a certain flexibility in your limbs and your muscles and your in your whatever it is the different parts of your body. The heart starts pumping. You don't go into high gear. You go gradually, and you work your your heart rate up. That, that's the way it's done. As in the physical, it's that that's the way it's done in the spiritual. You know, you, you buy a Maserati. They tell you to go from zero to 190 in three seconds. Could you imagine? And the sound, you could blow out every window in the neighborhood. That's the kind of noise it makes. You understand? That That's really getting, that's getting going. And where are you going to? Where's this guy going? He, he himself doesn't know where he's going to. It's the thrill of going. Where? This person always going to the oblivion. That's where he's going. But to him, it's irrelevant where he's going. As long as he's going. We as Jews, it's not enough just to go. We have to know where we're going. What is the destination? The ultimate purpose is gathering our exiles. Where? To the court, your holy courtyards. For what purpose? Because there we'll have a sensitivity and a capacity to appreciate what your statutes are, to do your will. They will have that appreciation. Here we're in exile, we're desensitized. We have no relevance. We don't have the capacity. And there we'll be able to serve you with a full heart. Our emotion will be fully consumed with your will. Nothing but that. Here, because of the nature of our situation, it's a whole different reality. We're shut down.